Welcome to We Love This Book. Today we are very excited to be here with Anthony Horowitz. We are celebrating 15 years of the Alex Ryder series. So congratulations. Thank you very much. We're going to ask you 15 questions about them. So, first of all, what has been your favourite moment of the, the whole kind of Alex Ryder experience? Being on the set of Stormbreaker. Okay. Uh, and watching the chase that opened the film being shot with two helicopters and a fast car and Ewan McGregor and loads and loads of cameramen. It was very exciting. And how did Alex Ryder first come into existence? It was a light bulb moment when I was quite young, really, watching a James Bond film and thinking, why is Bond so old? Wouldn't it be great if he was a teenager? Okay. It was a little thought that stayed in my head and that finally turned into Stormbreaker. If you have to, which is your favourite book? It's always difficult to say. I mean, Stormbreaker is my favourite because it's the one that began the series, it introduced the character, which changed my life, frankly. Mm -hmm. If you ask me my favourite, mm, so either Scorpio, okay. uh, which I think is in many ways the best, or it's Snakehead. I've always had a great fondness for Snakehead. Okay. I like the character of Ash, the Godfather. Do you have a favourite villain as well? Julia Rothman in Scorpio is my favourite okay. villain, named after the cigarette, um, which kills you. And uh, I suppose it's because she's a woman. Uh, she's the only female villain in the whole series, and okay. uh, there's a scene where she has a sort of rather seductive dinner with Alex in Positano in, a, in, um, in uh, Italy, and, and I always thought that was very creepy. What's your favourite location? Cause I, and I believe you've actually been and researched quite a lot. I've gone to them. every single location in oh all the goodness. books, okay. and I think actually my favourite location is the only one I didn't visit, okay. which is Murmansk in outer Russia, okay. where uh, the skeleton key finishes with the nuclear graveyard of, some, of submarines out there. It's just such a spooky, creepy area, and it exists, and it's terrifyingly dangerous. One day those submarines are going to blow up okay. and cause a nuclear holocaust or something. So some you sort. can't actually uh, go and visit that one? I could have, but it was just too difficult to get to. Actually, there were okay. two locations I didn't go to. The other one was out of space, which, uh, <laughs> but I thought Merman sounded really okay. interesting. Um, last favourite question is favourite gadget. I think it's the mosquito cream, the insect cream that turns up in Archangel. It doesn't repel insects, it attracts them, and two guards get smothered in and they get chased off with thousands of mosquitoes and hornets and locusts and other bugs chasing them. It just made me smile. And we've touched on this, but I want to know what was it like having the books turned into a film? Well, the Stormbreaker of the film ultimately was a disappointment because it didn't do as well as I'd hoped and it didn't mm. lead to every single one of those books getting filmed. But um, it was thrilling. I mean, it was very exciting to see so much effort, so many people, so much money, so much time being devoted to this insane story that had come out of my head. And, you know, I did think Alex Pettifer was great as Alex, and, and it was a fantastic cast. The film was a very near miss. It's got lots of good things in it, and I do like it. I wrote it. I stand by it. But it didn't quite hit the American market and it didn't lead to sequels, so it's a disappointment, but it was still fantastic fun. Now, there's lots of things going on to celebrate the 15th anniversary, so I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that. I believe there's a spy school. Well, that's happened. I mean, Blue okay. Peter ran something called Operation Petra, which yeah. was a, um, a competition for young people, of whom the three winners actually got invited into MI5 headquarters in England, in London, for the first time ever. I mean, the cameras and young people being invited in. A fantastic prize, very, very tough competition as well. I was a judge on it. And then there have been other things. I did a, uh, a broadcast in Scotland last week where I managed to speak to, I think, 15 or 16,000 children across the country. Then, of course, there are the new jackets, yes. uh, with the new jackets, which are... Yeah, well, that's kind of you. Um, <laughs> which, which do look fantastic, and they've been... I was at a bus stop yesterday, and a bus pulled in with all the Alex Rider books on the side. So I had got on the bus, even though I didn't want to go on it. Uh, I went the wrong way, just, just to be on the bus. Yes, no, it's not true. Not, not true, quite. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I felt like getting on the bus. I was so excited. It's been quite a fun time. An extraordinary thought that the new audience for Alex Rider wasn't born when I started writing the books. Okay. You know, 15 years ago, and I'm now reaching a whole new generation of yeah. sort of 10 and 11 year olds who are coming to the books for the first okay. time. And uh, it's, it's fantastic to think that the audience is continuing. I did do a little rewriting on these um, when okay. they were reissued, just to take out some of the sort of pop stars and footballers, <laughs> and one or two references that didn't yeah. work anymore, and one gadget had to go as well. Okay. Of all the gadgets, the only one that I felt it was ridiculous for Alex to be carrying was a CD player that <laughs> turned into a saw, used it okay. point blank. And at the time when I wrote it, 2001, 2002, everybody had a CD player, but nowadays, you know, mm. it's all digital, so I, I replaced that with something else. Will we see any more of Alex? No, I didn't think so. I, I'm not, I always wanted to limit the number of books. Um, I was very frightened of the series becoming tired, predictable, 
formulaic. I wanted each book to be as good as the one before, and that always suggested to me that I should limit the number I wrote. And I, was, I wasn't even going to do 10, but 10 was the number I finished up with. I do have one temptation, which is to, to, to write about Alex aged in his late 20s, okay. to come back and find him in later life and see what's happened to him and to try and work out if he hasn't been totally screwed up by all these adventures and if, if he's happy. Okay. Uh, it would be quite interesting to do that. Well, your books have been so popular well, with confident readers, but also they've been really great at like, engaging reluctant readers. And I was wondering just kind of what that's been like as a writer to have that response from young readers. It's been the best thing about writing the Alex Ryder series, to be honest with you. I mean, it's not what I set out to do. I just set out to write books that would entertain people and, and which people would enjoy. And then suddenly I found that, that they were having a very, it would seem, profound effect on young boys, people said in particular, who were reluctant readers, who were suddenly finding the pleasure of reading. And you can't help but be um, sort of moved by that. And, and over the years, I've sort of become something of a spokesperson for literacy, and I've got into schools, and I've got into government and talked about the importance of reading, of libraries, of school libraries, and of course, school librarians, more important than any of those things. I used to be a well, librarian. how could I possibly have known? <laughs> But, you know, it is my profound belief that every secondary school in this country should have a full-time professional librarian. It should be statutory. It's the most important person in a school in many ways, certainly the most important building. And this is the sort of thing that, you know, again, I didn't set out to be a spokesperson for librarians or literacy, but spending as many years as I have in the business, you can't help but get sort of influenced and get... And get sort of get persuaded of the importance of what you're, of, of, of these issues. And now onto a more grown-up spy, you mentioned James Bond, you're writing the new James Bond. I have so written it, it's done. Can you tell us anything about it? I can tell you very little about it, because <laughs> be the, 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 the Fleming Estate and Orion books have lawyers swirling yes. around me, waiting for to pounce if I, if I step out of line even an inch. Um, it's set in 1957, it's therefore set in the golden age of James Bond novels. The story starts two weeks after Goldfinger, it involves our Grand Prix racing, which is interesting because no book by Ian Fleming actually has Grand Prix in it. Oh. But he himself was planning to do a television episode with James Bond in the world of Grand Prix, which is the inspiration for this book. Okay. Uh, and uh, it comes out in September and that's it. That's okay. all I'm allowed to say. Okay, fair enough. Right, so we're in your offices, so I was wondering if we could just touch on your kind of writing life. So, do you have a writing routine? Or do you no, I don't, I don't. I try to avoid routine. I think okay. writing and routine are two sort of quite alien things to each other. Okay. And I, I think writing is more sort of a, it's a way of life. It's a passion. It's not a business. It's not a job. It's not something that you sort of sit down and do for a certain number of hours or number of words per day. I tend to start very early. I, I like to be writing by about seven thirty in the morning, and I I stop very late. Um, you know, I work pretty much all day, and I use the word work, but it isn't. It is something I love doing. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, we are in the offices of 11th Hour Films. This is actually my wife's office we're seeing at the moment. And um, uh, this is where we made Fallers War. And uh, we're now doing a new show called New Blood, which okay. is um, getting by the BBC next year. Uh, and I'm writing a novel and all sorts of other things. But it's, it's uh, I've always loved writing. I mean, when I was nine years old, I loved writing. And now I'm 60. And I love writing just as much as I did then. What is your most treasured book in here? Or maybe just at home as well? Well, my, well that's easy to answer. Okay. I have a wonderful Charles Dickens set, a 1946 Nonsuch edition, and that, without any question, okay. is probably my, my favourite uh, set of books. Okay. Uh, it's beautiful, and, and I worship Dickens' writing, and, uh, uh, and I, or I have done since I was in my 20s. I also have a lovely edition of Goldfinger, signed by Ian Fleming, okay. and that's a very special okay. book too. If your offices were going off in flames, what would you grab? It would probably be the books. Okay. Uh, I'd probably take the Dickens. It's quite hard to stagger out with you know, this huge pile of Charles Dickens. Or would it be the Flemings? I don't know. It would oh, be books. Books. Okay. Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> you can carry one pack for me. All right. Last question. Uh, we put on Twitter that we were chatting to you and we asked for some people's questions. And the one that people kept wanting to know was, what are your tips for young aspiring writers and children who want? Read. That's the first thing. The more you read, the better you write. The second, get out, have fun, have adventures. If you don't have something to write about, experiences to write about, you can't be a writer. Write what you know. It's much easier to write from a position of authority, the places you've been, the people you've met, the things that have happened to you, than to fantasize and to imagine okay. them. So having an element of truth in your writing, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. Write little and often if you're young. There's no point sitting in a room getting old, staring at a blank sheet of paper. 
Enjoy your writing. If you're not enjoying it, something has gone wrong. And finally, the most important piece of advice of all for all writers, believe in yourself. You know, the world is full of critics, some of them in the bookseller, who are going to tell you that your latest book is not in the top 10 bestsellers and it is not as good as the last one or whatever. You have to believe that what you're doing is, is the best work you can do. You have to enjoy it and you have to have confidence in yourself. There's only one difference between a successful writer and an unsuccessful writer. The unsuccessful writer stops. Thank you so much. Thank you to Anthony and congratulations and happy 15 year anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you.